thing that was very interesting, Josiah says was on 2 Kings 22, 1. It says Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Y'all don't have to stand. I'm just going to read some unless you choose to. Then verse 2 says in 2 Kings 22, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. What I found interesting in verse number 7 of 22, it says they was, a, they was receiving, uh, as we would say, money to reconstruct and build the temple. But verse 7 says, but don't require the construction supervisors to keep an account of the money they receive. For they are honest and trustworthy men. So much money was coming in towards God's temple and for God's temple to be rebuilt and so forth. They made the king made a declaration where you don't even have to count it. I trust them. Wouldn't it be good to have people like that around you in your life? Where so much money is being received where you don't even have to count it. Now jump down to verse 8. The second Kings. It says, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then uh, Hilkiah, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, gave the scroll to Saphin and he read it. And what I thought was very interesting, y'all can sit down now. What I thought was very interesting about the reading today is that when the king, first of all, was eight years old, and then when they found the scroll, which was the Constitution, and it was very limited uh, then, but the Bible says that when the king read the scroll, he got angry. He got real angry and began a series of religious reforms. He began to cast out stuff. He began to tear down things. He began to set the kingdom in order. Come on, somebody. Uh, and what I thought was interesting is that when he read the scroll, whatever it was convicted the king so much, and he realized, he said, we are out of order. And then he immediately kicked in the good, Pastor Dean, and started setting order in the kingdom. Now, it's amazing how they had portions of the word. But when he got, when he got the word read to him, he immediately moved into action. And if you read, begin to read 2 Kings 23, and I won't, my God, it's entirety. It was very interesting. And what I thought was so interesting for me is that I didn't read that many, many, many times. But it didn't have the effect that it had on me today. That's why you can't never think because you have read the Bible two or three times that you got God figured out. God can give you revelation after revelation after revelation after revelation after revelation. I don't know about y'all, but I done read scriptures and never seen it before. Like, I done read that. Now, why I didn't understand that then? Certain things God will keep concealed. Another word for concealed is hidden, my God, to our natural understanding for a, for a different time, different dip, dispensation, and so forth. That's why you can read something like, I just read this last year. Why come I didn't see it then? Because it wasn't time for you to get the revelation in. So when people say, I don't understand the Bible, yeah, I don't understand it either. I'm still learning the Word of God, and I've been reading the Bible since April the 30th of 1995, from start to finish every year, and there's still things that I miss. Keep in mind, from 1995 to present, and I still miss things. I still, my God, are learning about God's constitution. Are y'all with me so far? My God, in 2 Kings chapter 22, I mean 23, verse uh, I think that's, that'll be uh, number 16. It says, Then Josiah turned and looked up at the tomb of the man of God who had predicted these things. What is the monument over there? What is that monument over there, Josiah asked. And the people of the town told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted the very thing that you have just done to the altar of Bethel. An eight-year-old king heard God's word, got angry because he looked at the condition of the people and how they was functioning and worshiping, as I taught y'all past Sunday, idols and different gods, and they was bound down to Baal and so forth, where it provoked him, my God, to want to set, my God, his kingdom that God blessed him to oversee and manage in order. 
Then it says over there in verse 24, it says, Josiah also got rid of the mediums, the psychics, the household gods, the idols. It sounds like we might need to go home and look at what we got inside of our house. Don't you know you can invite and bring in, invite and bring in a curse into your house? By the things that you, oh, that's so cute. And you taking the set up there and making a decoration. You just invited in a curse. Know what you got in your house. Are y'all with me so far? And it says, in every other, other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah, he did this in obedience to the law written in the scroll. <laughs> ah, that man immediately moved into obedience. When you read the word of God, how many of y'all read your Bible? Let me see your hand. Okay, that's enough. When you read your Bible, have it provoked you to immediate obedience? Or when you read your Bible, you're like, huh, that applies to me. And then you just, it just, you just push it to the side and go on about life. Have we ever done that? I have. What I want us to understand is that the man of God read the word of God and it immediately forced him to do something different when it comes to how he was running the kingdom. Ain't it something that here was the king, the little eight-year-old boy that was king that felt like he was doing it, uh, watch me now, who felt like he was doing it right until he got a hold of the word. And when he looked at naturally, Minister Tina, what he was doing naturally when he, when, he, when he lined it up, my God, and looked at it from the word of God, he realized that there's a lot of things that is going on around me that is out of order. But guess how he got that revelation? Anybody want to tell me? Say that again. So he realized that things was out of order all around him in the kingdom that God gave him to manage, my God, because of what? Say that one more time. Again, so he realized that it's some stuff that he was allowed to go on as a king, my God, over his domain, my God, that, that the word of God showed him that was wrong. Is that what I'm understanding? And so when he realized that things was going on that was wrong, he immediately kicked in the gear and said, okay, I need to make this right. My God, it provoked him to a jealous anger. See, it's such thing as good anger and bad anger. The anger to make you shoot somebody, the anger to make you knock a hole in the wall, that's not good anger. My God, the Bible says Jesus got angry because they was mishandling the temple and he turned over the tables in the temple. See, that's good, righteous indignation, my God. But when you read certain things, do it, do it, do it, make you feel like, oh, I need to do better. Man, I'm tired of stumbling over this. Won't I get this stuff right? Do it ever provoke you? I just thought that was interesting. Maybe that wasn't for you, but that was for me. I'm just fascinated by how many times I've read that. And even understood the revelation behind that. But it didn't hit me like it hit me this morning. I want to be able to open up the Constitution of Wanda, Lawanya, and, and, and God show me something that needs to be corrected personally as well as in the church and move immediately. Immediate obedience. A immediate response. Because if you don't do it immediately, you're not going to do it. Don't you know we talk ourselves out of things every single day? Things that God will show you and reveal to you for you to make a decision about, my God, that's going to propel you to your next. We talk ourselves out of it. It's just that easy, my God, for us to be robbed of promotion. God make, make Because see, when God tells you to make a decision, it's going to lead to something else. Which is going to lead to something else. Which is going to lead to something else. Which is going to lead to something else. And you're going to look back and be like, how did I get her behind a series of right decisions? That you didn't even realize that God was taking you to this place. So now turn with, to me with, to Colossians, New Testament. Now I'm getting ready to see who wants to testify. But first I want to read this in the hearing, Colossians chapter 3. One of my favorite scriptures, portion of scriptures in the Bible. 3, starting in verse 1. When you have it, say amen. Since you have been raised, Apostle Paul talking to the Colossian church. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ first you got to understand that if you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior you've been raised to new life that right there is revelation in itself so that calls you and I to begin to shift and start trying to line our life up and align our life up with the new life are y'all with me 
Christ, uh, it says, newly, uh, been raised to new life with Christ. Set your sights, that means your focus, your vision, on the realities of heaven. Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to, that, to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's a loaded statement right there. Your real life is hidden in Christ. Oh, my God. In Christ. The real you, the core, is hidden in Christ. And so that tells me that in order for me to find the real me, that's hidden in Christ I need to have a solid relationship with Christ God, please please stay with me because you, you'll miss something that can help you listen to what the scripture is said it says think about these things my God the things of heaven not the things of the earth you die to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God, let me go a little deeper. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share all of his glory. So then Paul shifts and says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Uh, uh, don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. The Bible said, because of these things, the anger of God is coming. Paul then says in verse 7, he says, you used to do these things when your life, when your life was still a part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of, look, anger. First, the first list of sins for the flesh has to do with putting to death. There's certain things you have to kill, and then there are other things where the Bible says you got to read. Let me show you what read means. Look at me. Everybody look at me. It says read, anger, rage, malice. Read means you take it and you cast it off right now. Paul saying there are certain sins that you can't play with. And I just gave them to you, and I ain't for the mess with that. And the first one is always, it's something about sexual immorality that's always listed first. Oh, because it contaminates everything about a person. Oh, my God, it, it contaminates you, and it contaminates everything that's connected to you. Because when we allow sexual sin, my God, to dominate our life, our girls, our young girls, even our young boys are exposed to that spirit. And then we wonder why they tripping at a young age. And why they acting like that? Remember the Bible says, that what you sow, you shall. But then he says, my God, put to death those things. But then he says, read, cast off. Guess what? My God, when we was born into sin. So it's easy for us to sin. But these behaviors right here, I promise you, that the, your newborn baby, your little son now that's grown, he wasn't born angry. This second list of stuff, my God, is learned behaviors that we learned Along the way called life. Are y'all with me so far? See, that's a teaching moment right there. Look what he said right there. He says, he says, uh, da, 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 he says, he said, get, uh, get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. You didn't come out your mama's womb and I didn't cuss him. These are learned behaviors. I'm trying to teach you, my God. These are what you call learned behaviors, my God. And so we got to be just like we learned them, we got to unlearn them. Anything that you learn, you can unlearn. Oh, I'm still talking about freedom tomorrow if the Lord let us get there. My God, but you have to begin to unlearn these type of behaviors right here. Mm -hmm. Then it says, don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know the creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uh, uncivilized. Uh, has anybody ever been uncivilized? Have anybody ever acted uncivilized? Have you ever went to your job and act uncivilized? Have your kids ever made you act uncivilized? Come on, somebody. But they say the scriptures is outdated. They say the word of God is none of void at this day and time we're living in. I beg to differ. Slave or free, Christ is, uh, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in us all. 
Then it says, verse 12, since God chose you to be his holy people, he loves you. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, making allowance for each other's fault. Uh-oh. Give each other a pass. Understand that people are going to make mistakes. Quit getting so sticky. Quit being so offended so easy. That's what that's talking about. See, because we have to understand, we really got to understand the word of God. It says make allowances for other people's faults. That means people going to make mistakes. But when you clothe on mercy and you put on love and you put on kindness, when you put on gentleness, my God, you are able to be compassionate with people. You will say, okay, maybe she's just really having a bad day, so I'm not going to let that stick to me. I'm not going to let that offend me. My God, learn how to give people allowances. When you have a hard heart, you won't give nobody allowances. When you are bitter, you won't give nobody an allowance. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, it, says, it says, forgive anyone who offends you. See, it tells you to forgive quickly so the devil won't get a strong or a foothold on you. It says you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule your heart. Y'all know as we say, you can't have peace with God until you... We want the peace of God, but you got to be at peace with God. We want the peace of God, but you got to be at peace with God. And so we got to allow the Spirit of God to rule inside of us. There's certain work, as I stated earlier, the process. What I just read to you in the book of Colossians 1 through 12, all that down there, that is a process that you and I got to go through to begin to make some allowances, meaning changes, my God, in our lives and make allowances for other people. Many of us is, is, is sitting up wounded and scarred because we won't let go of stuff. But I don't even want to talk about that right there. I just want to show you because it was very interesting when I read the word of God how quickly Josiah, eight-year-old king, my God, quickly realized that he was out of order as the king and began to make a change just immediately. Immediately, Josiah served the Lord wholeheartedly. He was completely devoted to God. He had to pay a price. And so when we read the word of God, like I just read to us just now, with some things in that list. Everybody know what that list? Y'all see that list I read? There's some things in that list that we have to begin to put to death, cast off, and change clothes. Them is three points right there. Put to death, <laughs> cast off, and change clothes. We got to get rid of it. So tomorrow, if the Lord delay is coming, is the nation of freedom, right? It's supposed to be 4th of July, right? Okay. Freedom. Is that what it is? I'm wrong. Do it, what it mean? What does 4th of July mean? Independent. Post. Say it again. Okay, and it is, we are, we, we're no longer like we used to be, but in America. And I find it, I, I find it quite difficult for me, see, like every year when I think about freedom in America. And it always takes me back to the late Dr. Miles Monroe, who made me understand personally at 1519 West Pine, sitting in Gary McIntosh's office, he made a statement. He said, freedom is a state of mind. And then he wrote a book, my God, Minister Janice said, it's easier to exist in chaos than it is to live in freedom. So them are some of the, them are some of the first principles that I was blessed with coming up out of my former life to understanding that real freedom has everything to do with my mind, not my position. And so we sit in here tonight, and those looking by way of online, my God, have to ask ourselves, we living in the land of freedom. But how free are we? I'm going to say that right there. How really free are we? Because can I make you understand? Our children show sure enough need to understand. Because when you get 18, I'm grown. That means I can do what I want to. I kind of wish I could go back and be in my mama's house right about now. You know, we say when I'm grown, I can get my car, I can do what I want to do. But when you get that car and them licenses, you still got to obey the laws of the land. And so you don't really have real freedom without rules. <laughs> 
long as you got breath in your body, you're going to have to submit to a level of authority. Just read the book of Romans, chapter 13. You're going to always have to submit. You're going to always have to obey rules. You're going to always have to adhere and answer to somebody. Because we in America got that mindset that I'm grown, I can do what I want to. I don't have to answer to nobody. That has really affect the nation in America as well as the people that sits in our churches all around the world. Because we'll make our submission conditional. I'm grown. I don't have to obey you. I don't have to submit to you. I don't even have to go to your church. Now that is true. So we have adopted a mindset that says, I do what I want to do. And that same mindset, Brother Cherry, is how we serve God too. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Even though I know you gave me these gifts, I'll use them when I get ready. And so until then, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm mad because she didn't speak to me, so I'm going to sit down. They didn't let me sit where I want to sit at, so I'm going to leave the church. But we're supposed to be free. And the scripture just said, give allowances. Walk in love. Put away all that stuff. Change clothes. Read. Put to death. Get, some, get, get, a, get a, a surgical a scalpel and, 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 and cut. Do some circumcision. On your own self. Ouch. That was for me too. Cut your own self instead of wanting to cut somebody up with your words by lying and slander. Why don't you cut your own self like that? We free. There is no freedom without rules. There is no freedom without rules. That's a heavy loaded statement that'll get me ran out of a whole lot of churches. Because we think that we can do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. And the scripture goes against that, counterintuitive to that, because Paul said everything is permissible, but everything ain't beneficial. You can do what you want to do, but there's consequences. I've taught y'all, you and I get to make the choice, but you don't get to tell God what the consequences are going to be behind your choice. Are y'all listening to me so far? And so one of the things that we have to do in America in the land of the free, we have to take control of our thoughts. Because whoever get the mind get the life, right? Right? Uh, Solomon says, as a man thinking so he becomes. We teach in discipleship one. My God, you and I, I and you are the sum totals of our very own thoughts. Let me go a little deeper. If you don't like the fruit that's manifesting external, you got to look at what's going on Internal. Are you with me so far? Remember, some sins you inherited because you and I are created after Adam. And there's other things that we learned that we have the power through the Holy Spirit to cast off. So if you know you struggle with anger, then you have to begin to circumcise your thoughts. So instead of punching a wall, how about going to lift some weights? Instead of putting your hands on your wife or your girlfriend, why don't you go cut that yard, my God, and wash that car that's dirty. See what I'm say? You got to redirect your anger. See, you got to rechannel. You got to, my God, shift. Mm. Come on, somebody. You don't get to give yourself a pass. And my God said, you made me mad. If you would have said that, I get to do that to you. The devil is a lie, Christians. See, what you got to understand, since we're in the land of the free, I'm flowing in God. My God, this is the stuff that Paul is talking about to Christians. He said you used to do these things. Oh my God, God will give you a pass in the past. But you can't let your past dictate your present. Are you with me so far? And so my God, true freedom has to do with everything got to do with your mind. Paul says in order to be cross crossed over, y'all hear me say from a caterpillar to a butterfly, you got to do it by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is the most powerful tool that God has given you. It is. Literally, you change your mind, everything about your life will change. Can I help some of us that's looking at ourselves through broken mirrors? That broken mirror is the perception and the words and the things that has been done to you. 
So when you see yourself, because he told you, even mama and grandma and some daddy told you you was fat, you was ugly, you was too skinny, you got zits on your face, whatever happened to you, come on, I'm talking, come on, come on. You sorry, this and that, all that stuff has formulated your belief system. And so when you and I open up the Constitution, we can't fully receive and accept this. Because, my God, the people that has, has broken and shattered our spirit, their voice speak louder than God's voice. This right here, for y'all that don't know, my God, is God's voice. You talk about God don't speak to me. Yeah, you do open up your Bible. He speak every day. Because every word in here is God's voice. It comes straight off the press. It comes straight from heaven. It comes off the altar of fire. If you want to know what God is saying, uh, or if you just want somebody to talk to you, oh, my God, just open the Bible let God talk to you. Are you listening to me? And so, my God, many of us, my God, even though we are physically free, we got up and went to jobs. We put on clothes, we put up on makeup, we put on our shoes, we put on our pants. We did all of that stuff, my God, headed out to take care of business in the land of the free. But when we get to a job, my God, soon we pull up, first thing we say is, dang, I don't want to be here. Really, Pastor, no, before that, the night before I got up, my God, I was thinking about, I don't want to be here. There's so much purpose and potential in you. As the late doctor said, the graveyard is the richest place on earth. Because many people die without ever, without ever living. Will you die without ever living? Will you just exist? Will you die before you ever live? I'm going to set that on you. Will you die before you ever live? The real you is hidden in Christ. Until you get a vibrant, solid, healthy, intimate relationship with Christ, you're not living. Anytime you and I choose to live on the outer court, we're in trouble. Sooner or later, my God, you and I got to get to the point as you pray and go through the temple. That's a whole other teaching in itself. To where you desire to get into the holiness of holiness. Where you read stuff like this and it shatters your whole self-image and self-esteem. When you open up the Constitution and God show you you, not the people that you pastor. When you open up the Constitution and God show you you, not your friends that you've been angry with for the last three years. See, you know you're getting closer when you start realizing that you're so unworthy and you got so much work to do. See what I'm trying to say? So many of us are physically free sitting at 205 South Sheridan. God is working. It is a process. And I'm going to go back to the question, how free? Are you? And are you really free? Because you could be dealing with some things that don't mean you're not free. <laughs> See, I'm going to pick you up. But I had to make sure I laid the foundation first. You and I, I and you, like myself, is dealing with things that don't mean I'm not free because I'm free, for real, for real, for free. See what I'm trying to say? But there is other things, uh, 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 Trayvon, that I got to continue to uh, keep that scalpel. on. I got to continue, my God, to crucify. And if you think about the list of things that Paul was sharing with the church, it is killing freedom, spiritually say. Many of us is angry. We're angry at people. Some sitting here tonight is angry at God. We're angry at our kids. Our kids is angry at our mamas. My, uh, our kids is angry at their daddies. Some that was there, some not there. We ain't had boss, past husbands. We had present husbands, present wives, past wives, and grandmas, and great grandmas, the white man. My God, the police that gave me that, that speeding ticket because I was speeding. My God, that lawyer that said, you finna go to the penitentiary and put you on paper instead. Angry. America, people is angry. And they sitting in churches all across the country, angry. But we live in the land of the free. We are bitter, but we live in the land of the free. We have the choice. In some countries, people don't, the, 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 the country makes the choices. We have free will. We have the choice. God said in order for you to be forgiven by him, you got to forgive. God gave us a choice to forgive. We won't even forgive. Other people don't have no choice. They've been told what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. See, I'm trying to say we have a choice to obey God, and we still choose not to obey God. But we're in the land of the free. We have the Constitution afforded to us. Remember, Josiah had limited 
He had, it was a limitation to the word. Thank you, Holy Ghost. They didn't have the fullness of the word back then. But the little bit of word that he got shook his whole life at eight years old. Which one of y'all kids is eight? Who's eight? Who's eight? Anyone of y'all kids eight? Who's nine? Come here. Come here, son. Come here. Come on. Come on, son. Come on. Be scared. Come on. Come on. You say you nine? Well, you sure is handsome. Let me see your hand. What's your name? Rylan. Say that. Rylan. You are handsome Rylan. So get this image. You nine, right? Yeah. Now check this out, y'all. Boy, ain't this kid handsome. Your hair look like AJ's when he was little. AJ, remember your hair? Grandson, you grow your hair back. <laughs> Josiah was a year younger than this kid. Get a good image of this. Because I see, I tend to see that images work in this church. Stand right here. Just stand right here, son. I'm not, just stand right there. Look, I want you to stand right there. Yeah, he is ain't handsome. The king, the king that I'm talking about, stay right there, was one year younger than him. Just stay right there, son. The way we have in America the freedom to open up our Bibles. Many of you walked in there with your Bible. If you didn't carry your Bible, you could turn on your Bible. The freedom that we have, the access that we have to God's word. This eight-year-old king did not have the full access that we have to the whole complete constitution. But the little bit that he heard shifted him into immediate obedience. At eight years old and he began to he began a spiritual reform of a whole nation not a church eight years old Shante and he shifted a whole nation that means he was gifted with wisdom at eight why are you disqualifying yourself at 38 God gave this king at eight the wisdom to shift a whole nation so you think God can't shift you? Think about that. A king, eight, shifted, behind limited access to God's word, and he caused a spiritual reform to a whole nation. At eight years old, he was gifted with wisdom, gifted with knowledge, gifted with understanding. At eight, the spirit of God breathed. God breathed on him. We in America. The land of the free. When we begin, let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. Go ahead, sir. I can imagine, as I think about the Declaration of Freedom now, because of what I know, that many of the forefathers associated freedom we're no longer having a slave master telling me what to do and how to do it and when to do it. If you and I don't keep our flesh in submission, our flesh become our slave master. We in America are grateful that we don't have a slave master, physical furrow, telling us what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. But they forgot that's natural. According to the spirit, true freedom has to do with as a man thinking. So he becomes. So, who wants to go first? I got five minutes to come tell me about your real spiritual freedom. I did that falling and flowing in God because I want you to understand freedom ain't got nothing to do with you being physically out of jail or you're not being held captive. State of mind. Who got a testimony about spiritual freedom? Go. Hello. So, um, a couple months ago, I had surgery, and um, I had been battling my body for a while. I kind of knew that I was sick. It started last year. I started having some symptoms, and I knew the surgery was approaching, but I was terrified. Um, 
I knew the degree of my sickness. I was very well aware. The doctors had informed me. I was aware because I felt it and I was experiencing it myself. And I had my surgery and they removed some stuff. And afterwards, I was still struggling with uh, the after effects of surgical procedures. But I started to think about all the times that I've harbored infection and I didn't say anything. I didn't take any action. Um, I didn't take the antibiotics when they gave them to me. I didn't, you know, go get the blood work when they told me to go get the blood work. And I was holding on to this sickness. And I thought about my spiritual life and how I was holding on to things that were killing me. But it was more comfortable for me to keep them than it was for me to get rid of them. I would rather be sick than be healed because of the pain, because of what it would cost me to be free and be whole. So that's my spiritual testimony. I could tell I trained you because you got right up there, handled your business, and got it right out the way. You didn't take me all down going there at all costs because we ain't got that type of time. You got right up there, that's discipline, fathering you. Handled your business and got right out the way. That's pulpit etiquette. Let's give God a hand for the woman of God. I want to see one of these kids over here. Which one of y'all got a testimony? Which one of y'all kids is ready to come out y'all shy zone? That's a good sign for me. And I did that for a reason. Because it let me know that the new season is at hand. Because there's no reason. And I understand they're babies. But every one of them, at least one of them, should be able to say, Pastor, let me say something. Because they had a touch from God. And not saying they have it. It's just time for them to go deeper into intimacy with God, where God can begin to remove the fur, because all of them got a testimony. They just don't want to tell nobody because they don't want to be in front of the camera. But they got to break that because there's kids all around them that's dying on their way to a burning hell because they won't testify because they're letting the spirit of fur grip them. I hope my students and my teachers are listening about dealing with the spirit of fur that's paralyzing our children and paralyzing even adults. What's so at? Solo, come testify. Come on, Solo. She was way in another level. I looked at her I said, and I said, Solo. She said. Um, I'm going to try not to cry. I'm going to be real quick like Miss Q did. Um, I left the enemy in my household. And I got all this faith, all this worship. And I let doubt creep in. And God was moving in every area but where I wanted him to move at. And I'm like, God, did you hear me? Where are you at? I'm getting mad. I'm getting angry. I'm standing. I'm being strong. And where are you at? You moving everywhere but where I want you to. But what he's saying was telling me was, I need to trust his will, be in, trust the process to stand, to keep pushing, to stay encouraged, to be still and know that he is God. He will move when he's ready. So I let go, and I said, God, that's your will to be done. I said, God, um, I'm getting out the way. I'm getting out the way. Your will be done. Whatever it is that you need in my life, use me. I'm going to trust you and trust the process. And, of course, I know exactly what she's talking about, so I give God the glory. Who else? What's your testimony? Stood up. You said there's change coming for you? Come down and tell me about it. Because what we got to understand is when I hear stuff like that, I'm going to be expecting that. It's easy to get up and testify, but then you're going to have the actions behind it? Yes. Okay. Um, 
for a while now, I've been spotty with coming to church and dealing with the kids with game time. And it's just me dealing with myself. You know, um, Pastor made a, a great illustration on there's two sides. You know, there's your past, and then there's the area that God has for you. And what I've been dealing with, um, looking at my past so much, you know, because over here I got mom, dad, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, everybody. But out here, where God has me, it's just me. And God wants me to go ahead and lean this way and not worry about your past. And the sermon you did, Pastor, it shifted my mind completely. So 2.30 this morning, I get a phone call from my sister saying something's wrong with mama. Call her real quick. What's, we don't know what's going on with her. So i like, God, I don't know what this is. This sucks. But I came too far to go back. So God wants to see, regardless of what's going on with my past, because that, that's, that's my mom, you know. Everybody loves their mama. And stuff happened with my dad. My grandpa passed away. God's just checking me, Kenny, you over here now. It's a specific reason why God brought me out here by myself, because it's going to become a time where God will release me to go back home. But until I get what I need from God, I'm standing right here. Abraham, leave thy family. Go. When you said that, that was dropped in my spirit. Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. Go home and read it tonight. Who else got a testimony of real freedom? That's a good testimony, too. He told the truth, too. Amen. You know, Pastor, walking with you uh, has been a major challenge in my life, a major challenge. There's so many times when NFL football was on TV, NBA basketball games were on TV, and I would hear the spirit of the living God beckon at my spirit that first things is first. And what I need from you, son, is to get in my word. And I think I talked about this once before in our men's meeting. And in spite of me hearing the voice of the living God, I shunned it for a ball game. And watching your steadfastness in Christ and watching your discipline as well as your pursuit has had a major effect on my life. And um, my wife is a living witness. Uh, you know, now the ball games don't matter. It just don't matter anymore. And... Um, the only thing that really matters now is to hear job well done, Pastor. You know, my next birthday, I'll be 60 years old. And I'd have lived more years than I have to live. And on my desk at home, I have written in bold letters that everything counts now. Everything it counts, and everything matters. So therefore, it has just redirected my life. Amen. My God, if he had time. Well, I would like to give a little testimony about as far as my finances 
and how I, I remember when I had struggled with my tithes, I didn't want to pay. Uh, this was a little years back. I've been delivered since then. Uh, I didn't want to pay my tithes because I was watching what was going on. I see envelopes being passed around, and I didn't, I said, I'm not giving no money. And I didn't. And I remember my husband said, Sharon, you know, everything you do, you do unto Christ. Stop looking at, paying attention to what you see. So I said, okay, well, I'm not paying all of it. So and I didn't. I told, paid half of it. But when I got that revelation and God dealt with me, because it's a hard issue, and he dealt with my heart, and I paid everything I was supposed to pay. And when I did that, God blessed me. He showed me that I am a man of my word. And I got blessed with way, way more than I tied. So right now, I stand on that. You know, you got to expect, and I expect. And now, I am way blessed in my finances. Because it used to be a time where I'm not giving anything, and I find myself giving and not minding. And I don't give for God to bless me back. I give because it makes me feel good, because I am blessed to be a blessing. So when you when you faithful with your finances, because I have what I have, because he gave it to me, he enabled me to make it. I would make way more than I ever thought I would make. So why not be a blessing? And I love, 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 love my job. And God blessed me with that job. I used to dream about, now I work, I'm just going to say, I work for a millionaire. And I used to wonder what it was like to work for a millionaire. See, I'm being long-winded, though. But, <laughs> but I used to dream about it. And I used to say, I wonder what it's like to work for a millionaire. So God blessed me. He put me there. But he didn't just put me there because to see how it is to work for one. I learned things. Everything I missed out of my life, I, got, I, I, I traveled in places I never thought I could go or even wanted to. And just have given me back everything that I thought that I lacked or I didn't have or I thought I deserved. But I also had in that process him giving me what I thought I lacked. I had to give back to him. And that's my obedience, loving and praying and forgiving. And it was a time in my life I had to. I mean, I had to, and I said, quit this. It's not something I had to think about. It was something I had to do immediately. And then and that's what I did. So that's my, t that's my testimony is my finances. So if you want to be blessed in that, and if you're struggling with your bills or if you're struggling with money, you know, what you need, give it to somebody that, that do need it. And watch how God show up. Watch how you show up. But let me, can I show one more thing? Okay. I was at, the, I was at Walgreens. And uh, it was this homeless lady in line, and I was there with my boss, and she was buying a whole bunch of paper, uh, paper towels and stuff. And so she was putting back stuff. And then I said, I get it. Go ahead. Go ahead on and get it. And then she said, are you sure? Are you sure? I said, yes. So my boss was standing in the back, but she, wouldn't, she, she don't see that well, so she didn't really know what the lady was doing. So I went here, and so she started putting back. I said, no, give it all. So I asked the lady. I said, well, how much is it? And she said, $13. So I paid it. When, I, when we got back to my boss's uh, uh, villa, we, um, I, went to the, I went back to Walgreens. And when I come back, now this was $13. Now when I went back uh, to bring her back her medicine, she said, here's Sharon, here's $60, because uh, uh, it took you so, I mean, t I took you way longer than you supposed to have. See how quickly I got that back? It was $60, but it was a time I didn't have 60 cents. So hey. You know. Amen. Amen. I give God the glory. And one thing about the woman of God, that this whole thing up here. This whole union. Complete. And Sharon is a 100 percent tithe and have been for a long time in this ministry. Even when she goes out of town, she makes sure that her husband has her ties. Pastor Chan brings her ties and sows them into the kingdom. Sharon has never, ever, six years, missed paying her ties inside of this ground. Why her? Many of you, including you, have helped pay for where you're sitting at, destiny. 
because of your faithfulness, we get to do business in God's kingdom. And I give God the glory for that. Amen. Amen. Come on, Natalie. And then I'll let us go. Mm-hmm. You know, she liked to talk, so I got to stay right here with her. Praise the Lord, everybody. Well, my testimony is that uh, God blessed me to see me and give up the eye. Okay. When I gave up the eye and listened to the Lord and began to live the way that he wanted me to and actually got in the word and began to read it and got my directions, I'm blessed today to have my wonderful husband and my son. Well, as y'all know, Pastor preached a sermon, and he was talking about head-on collision. And he told us to call out them people's name. Now, I could see what all they was doing wrong, okay? And I was here that Sunday, and I called out their name. Let me hold on to you a little bit. I feel like I'm going to fall. I called out their name, and I was like, you know, Fram, I'm tired. I could, t I could tell everything that they was doing wrong. But then I went home, and I was still thinking about all of them. I'm mad at all of them, my daughter, my son, my husband. They done this and that. And I got in my prayer closet and I heard it just as clear as day. You changed. I said, what? Write it down. So I wrote it down on my paper. Change. And then I just began to walk back and forth. And I was talking about change in me. Okay. But when I walked out the room and I began to pray for each and every one of them, I was going to their room. They thought I was talking about them again. But now I was talking about the change in me. But when the change took place and I realized that I wasn't doing everything, but everything was going to be done by the will of God, look at me now. So, I mean, to all you married women and you're going through, it might not all be about him. Some of it might be about you. Mm. It's a lot of substance into that right there. Natalie, that applied to me. It's real talk, daughter. That ain't even half for the story of Sharon and Natalie and even Sola. I thank God, even for you, Q. Because, see, I know your stories. I know the condition, naturally as well as spiritually, y'all was in when y'all came to this church. And what has happened... In, and has happened, what has happened to a lot of people is that they forget the condition they was in when they showed up at 3434 South Garnett. People soon forget. And as y'all continue to go through y'all process, Natalie, because everybody can't handle Solomon. Everybody can't handle Lorenzo. Alf uh, uh, Alfonso. Lorenzo, everybody can't handle your daughter. I have watched, look at me, daughter, countless of people, and I'm closing, that I love and really care for, and someone may be watching me right now, shipwreck, as Paul says. Disconnect for whatever reason, and some of it may be justified, some of it may not be justified. But when you make decisions out of flesh, when you don't seek God for counsel and guidance, when you begin to make decisions out of wounded and broken mirrors, come on, somebody. You got to understand that when you make decisions, you're not the only one that's going to be affected behind your decisions. And there's some, my God, that has made decisions, and now their husbands don't even go to church no more. At least they was coming. But because your P12 leader didn't do you right, you quit coming and now your hood don't come at all. And now you're not in church at all no more. See, it's a domino effect. But remember, we're in America. We're free. So when we make the choices, the choices just, just affect her or him. It affect everything that was connected to him. So when you made a decision to come to going off of Christ Church, Patrice, you said he preached. Who is that man? He too hard. I'm going somewhere, y'all. I ain't going back to that church. And didn't come back for a couple weeks. 
But the Spirit of God kept bringing her back because her coming to going home for Christ had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with you two. See what I'm trying to say? So if you would have listened to your flesh, that man right there that set free and delivered from 30 years of stone cold alcoholism will still be an alcoholic right now today. So some of you need to stop and think about your decisions. Because your decisions just don't affect you. It affects everything and everybody that's connected to you. Mm. Tomorrow, if the Lord delays coming, is the 4th of July. I want every last one of you to make sure that you let your light shine. Be a witness. Look for an opportunity to be a blessing to some of your families and loved ones and some of those people that you may be holding in unforgiveness or whatever may be going on. Some family members that you, uh, when they come to the family barbecue, you make sure that you stay on the other side of the room because you don't want to cross their paths and stuff like that. And they see you in church. They know you go to church and they know you go. See, we in kind of in trouble, Chairman, because when we say we go to a church and the name of it is going hard for Christ, and then when our family members and friends let go, that's the church you go, what, what, see, we don't understand. You go to a church called going blue, you see me, you. <laughs> church, I want all of us to be free. Some things happen immediately. Other things is a process. And the Bible study went the way the Spirit of God wanted it to go. I got a, a message, don't I, Mahogany? I can preach. I still want y'all know, preach about a bucket. That ain't nothing. I'm glad. <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> oh, my God. But I wanted us to understand, too, really, though. I really want to understand that freedom has everything to do with your mental condition. And that's why I want to encourage you to make sure if you don't learn nothing, don't remember nothing else, just make sure that you open up the Constitution and remember that eight-year-old king that got the word read to him and he immediately started to change the nation and started setting it in order for God's spirit to move. You all are blessing. Remember, your life is hidden in Christ. The real you is in Christ. Your happiness is in Christ. Your peace is in Christ. Your deliverance is in Christ. Your healing is in Christ. If you could do like Sister Nelly said, get the I out of the way. My God, I understand that everybody else's fault. How about looking at yourself sometime? Come on, somebody. Now, understand that real freedom redundantly is in the mind. Now, how many of y'all could be honest and say, there's some work to be done in my mind? Let me see your hands. 